Good evening and welcome to Innescorthy Library. The subject matter of our history lecture tonight is Edward Richards. The Richards family have been associated with Monks Grange for many generations. In fact, the history of the family reflects the history of Ireland from the 18th to the 19th centuries. Our lecturer tonight is Jeremy Hill, the present owner of Monks Grange. Jeremy. Thank you, Jarrett, for your kind introduction to my talk. Obediently yours, 19th century letterbooks of Edward Richards, born at Monk's Grange in County Wexford in 1826. The construction of the internet has led to a 20th century revolutionary change as great as the Industrial Revolution 250 years ago. Modern communication by text and email has turned letter writing on its head and introduced styles of familiarity that would horrify a 19th century correspondent. What, I wonder, would Edward Richards have made of a sign-off like NRN, IMO or BTW, while WTF would be utterly unthinkable? Edward's formal closing phrase in his 1850s letterbooks was a subservient, obediently yours, LOL. 195 years ago, when Edward Richards was born in the parish of Killan in 1826, there was a surprisingly good rate of literacy in the country. The result of numerous private hedge schools and an increasing amount of clerical teaching. By 1841, nearly half the children in Ireland aged five and over could at least read, while half of those over 15 were also numerate. Literacy in Italy and Spain, in comparison, was less than half the Irish rate, and in France, more than half of the recruits to municipal bodies were illiterate. This didn't necessarily mean that there was a lot of letter writing going on in early 19th century Ireland, when literacy was applied mainly to record keeping and admin tasks alongside business letters. Private and personal letter writing was mainly to preserve of the middle classes and up. Illustrated here in a watercolour by Edward Hayes are Edward Richards on the left with his brother in 1829. The young boy's educational opportunities were to be better than most. Edward's father had trained as a lawyer and had inherited the family farm at Monk's Grange. So after some primary schooling at Killegny, Edward was then a boarder at Lismore School in County Waterford after briefly attending Fortora School in County Fermanagh. He became an apprenticed engineer working on railway laying between Waterford and, and Clonmel and building work on the Shannon navigation at Athlone Bridge and Mealick Lock. It's obvious I know but a handwritten letter is very different to an email, a text or a card bought at a newsagent or bookshop. Remembering the times before email, when you couldn't simply track the thread of a communication through your inbox or sent mail, before photocopies, faxes or even carbon copies, how would you remember what you'd written to who and when? This is where letterbooks come in. They are the forerunners of the inbox and the sent box. Edward Richard's letterbooks are primarily a sent, books, sent box where he would copy each letter he sent and sometimes the reply into a bound volume. The really organised people would include an index of their letters, a practice Edward followed to a limited degree. For both business and personal correspondence, this allowed our 18th and 19th century counterparts to stay up to date on their correspondence and allowed them to refer back to past letters they had written or received. Letters had to be written twice, the original and then the copy. So it was a task requiring discipline, which would hardly have survived the constant interruption of the mobile. As well as keeping letter books, Edward Richards, like many others of his time, also kept a commonplace book or a 19th century form of Pinterest. If you liked a particular quote or the verse of a poem, you'd copy it into your commonplace book, the majority of which were compiled by women but they were popular across both sexes. But many at least, uh, sorry, different people organise these commonplace books in different ways, but many are at least partially organised by topic. 
commonplace books provided a slightly different view from other sources of topic, time period or individual, as they are more of a cultural activity or a glimpse into the interests of a particular person at a given time, as opposed to diaries or letter books, which provide a broader narrative. So what's important about letter books and why should public funds be used to preserve them? The first thing to say is that the nobility, aristocrats and gentry are mentioned everywhere in history. People who worked, labored, plowed and rented are barely mentioned right up to the 20th century when the 1901 census recorded occupations. So estate papers and letter books are the only records that talk about everybody in the land. For the vast majority of people, they are one of the few sources in which to find ancestors and family history. Letters also provide a window into social history written by the people of the time. The Monk's Grange collection of letter books contains copy after copy of letters. Six of Edward Richard's letter books have survived, the first dating 1857 to 58, while he was living in America, and the rest from 1876 to 1897, when he was back at home in County Wexford. There is a total of 4,557 letters. That's about 200 a year. He also kept a notebook or diary from which he wrote what he called his reminiscences in two thick volumes. And this writing all took place on top of a day's work. Edward was a practical man, a good carpenter, and he enjoyed working the land. Working on railway development in Virginia and Pennsylvania in America, he was proficient at building log huts to live, to live in and sleep as he went along the new rail route. And here is his sketch for a quickly made one-roomed timber hut. For researchers, private or professional, letter books are an instant communication with the past and can be the beginning of the scholar's next question. Talking about the recent reports into mother and baby homes, Katrina Crow, past head of the National Archives of Ireland, noted that the official record can tell us what happened, but rarely what it felt like. It's in letters that feelings are expressed. Private domain of personal experience has always been at odds with the official stories, which were sanctioned, permitted and encouraged by church and state. So in letter books, we are hearing a story from the inside of Irish life that gives these books their value as human testimony. Monk's Grange archives have been offered a grant by the Heritage Council in 2021 to digitize the final two volumes of letters and to create an index of all six. We've already digitized four volumes from our own voluntary funding raised over the last four years. The final two volumes contain about 50% of the four and a half thousand letters written. And we are one of four organizations in County Wexford benefiting from the 2021 Heritage Council Community Grant Scheme. Funding had not been made available in the previous two years due to budget cutbacks, and we obviously welcome this reintroduction and are grateful for the support which enables us to continue working towards our objective of conservation and preservation of our resources and the advancement of education. It is interesting, by the way, to note that the Australian National Archives have just received an emergency grant of $67 million following years of declining government support and budget cutbacks. An emergency crowdfunding plan had raised almost $100,000 before an embarrassed cabinet in Canberra recognised the importance of halting the imminent disintegration of documents, films, audio recordings and artefacts. Worldwide, local and community studies, archivists and manuscript curators are reassessing the informative value of business and institutional records. Wexford County Council Archive, for instance, holds a large collection of the archival material relating to the well-known New Ross building suppliers, William Graves and Sons. Letter books, account books and other business records originally preserved because of their association with an individual or the early years of a community or business or as a document of economic history 
are often the most significant surviving records of the early years of a community. Frequently, they constitute the only non-governmental record of the lives of many ordinary people. In the early 19th century, account books were kept by farmers, artisans and labourers, as well as by merchants and manufacturers. While not as readily intelligible as diaries, letters, newspapers and other forms of prose documents, account books kept by individuals and small businesses may be easily interpreted once their basic format is understood and considered alongside the prose record. Here we see one of the more legible pages, though the thin tissue is allowing the next page to show through. Primary sources, such as letter books, bring the thoughts, words and actions of past centuries into the present, allowing a comprehensive research experience. Students and researchers can examine the literary, political and social culture of the past and develop a more meaningful understanding of how history continues to impact the world today. They are created by witnesses to or participants in an event and are first-hand testimony and evidence created during the time period being researched. Here we see the ink starting to leak from the original script uh, and, thick and the thickening of the lettering makes it harder to read. The deterioration of the ink lettering is the major threat uh, being uh, addressed by the grant through the digital uh, digitization of these letters. The inclusion of an index improves discovery, analysis and workflow for the researcher by increasing efficiency and easing access. Without an index to the Edward Richards letter books, it's unlikely that a researcher would read 4,556 letters only to find what he or she was looking for in letter number 4,557. Edward's simple index is being vastly improved, again with the help of the Heritage Council grant. Letter writing has been going on for a long time. The earliest literary authors date back to 2,500 BC. The first ever handwritten letter was thought to have been sent by the queen, Persian queen Atossa in about 500 BC, but according, according to the ancient historian Hellenicus. Apostolic letters were written by popes to address administrative, administrative questions and to exhort the faithful on doctrinal issues. And there are 13 books of the letter of Paul the Apostle. Four hundred and fifty years ago, painted Woman in Blue reading a letter. Luminous and exquisitely rendered with its emotional use of colour, it is one of Vermeer's most captivating portrayals of a young woman's private world. The Paris-based journalist Catherine Field has described the creativity at the heart of a handwritten letter, noting that they are a deliberate act of exposure and a form of vulnerability because handwriting opens a window on the soul in a way that cyber communication never can. She goes on to remark on the savouring of the arrival of a letter and then its ongoing safe safekeeping, though this latter writing may be more of what the French call billet doux or love letters than a business communique. Vermeer's Woman in Blue is definitely not reading a letter from her bank manager. The conservation process we are using to digitise the letter pages is tedious and painstaking. And here you can see a, a fading letter, the ink fading and some, uh, some letters uh, actually holding. The letter copies, copies are on a very fine tissue paper, which is flimsy and fragile. The tissue has to be handled with great care. Some pages have been creased from previous handling, which requires careful unfolding and then they are laid on a flatbed scanner with recording settings for TIFF files at 300 dpi. Each image is then saved with its reference number onto a memory stick. At the end of the day, the working memory stick is copied onto a master stick and onto a hard drive. We do about 12 an hour or roughly 100 a day when all's going well. The final book in the series is in poor condition and the procedure will be much slower. While the scanning is being done, 
An archivist will decide whether the scanning page is legible on screen. If the ink has leaked into the tissue too much or it has faded badly, lettering within the words becomes hard to read, so the original copy in the letterbook has to be studied visually and a transcription made. Once a page is deemed legible, it will be read for indexing, in other words, names and sometimes addresses will be compiled. The whole digitization and indexing process will take about four months to complete. Though paper is a, an organic substance subject to decay over time, it can be stabilized if treated in time, but saving tissue is very difficult. And as I've said, iron gall ink leakage is impossible to halt by conservation treatment, so the letterbook contents will soon become unreadable, hence the urgency of the scanning. The weakest volume in terms of distressed condition, inadvertent creases and diaphanous tissue cannot be processed on a flatbed scanner, so a camera is used to create the recorded image. Back in 2018, we digitized the 1876 to 80 letterbook. It's the second book in the series of six, and it was taken out of order because it was being used to research a lecture on the Edward Richards Celestial Observatory built at Monk's Grange in 1872 and thought to be County Wexford's first. During the summer of 2020 and working within pandemic restrictions, we digitized three more of his letterbooks, all of which were in a, fra a fragile condition. They are typical copy letterbooks of their time and written in Oak Allen ink. We've seen that letterbooks are forerunners of saved emails. Relatively few letterbooks have survived as many businesses discarded them after a period of years. Edward Richards' letterbooks are an important source for the period as he had corresponded, corresponded with family and friends, solicitors, scientists, politicians, booksellers and merchants in Ireland, Britain, the United States and Europe. Unfortunately, he did not keep much of the other side of the correspondence, the inbox. In addition to the letterbooks, the archives hold some of Edward's loose letters, mostly written to his mother or daughter, and the letter books need to be considered in conjunction with them. I am immensely grateful to archivist Leslie Whiteside's reading of letter book volume one, which dates from April 1857 to April 58. Leslie has allowed me extensive access to her research notes, from which I now quote and illustrate with a sample page of Edwards' in index. The letters in the first volume are written from Lebanon in Pennsylvania, where Edward was a resident engineer on the construction of the Lebanon Valley Railway. This railway, built to link the towns of Harrisburg and Reading, opened in January 1858. The new index, which has been created, will increase uh, the ease, ease, ease of use to those, for example, who are interested in American railway history. Edward Richards had trained in Ireland as a railway engineer before he emigrated to America. Although there are extant letters from 1846 to 47, while he was an apprentice on the Waterford and Limerick Railway, there are very few references to the job other than that it was hard, cold work. Restless and anxious about his health, Edward left Ireland and sailed to North America in May 1847. He returned later that year, but in December 48, he left again, this time to stay. He quickly got work uh, in railway construction in Pennsylvania, but he often found that his hard work did not secure a job that matched his abilities. Railway engineering was a closely knit profession and employment contracts often depended on being known to the chief engineer. Richard Osborne, chief engineer of the Lebanon Valley Railway, knew Edward from the time in the 1840s when they were respectively chief engineer and apprentice on the Waterford and Limerick line. Although Osborne was born in London, he spent his childhood in Ireland and was educated at the Trinity College School in Waterford. Osborne went to America in the 1830s and got a job with the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad Company. In 1845, he returned to Ireland, becoming chief engineer 
to the Waterford and Limerick Railway, but in 1852 he returned to Philadelphia. Later, he was chief engineer of the Camden and Atlantic Railroad, and it was reportedly he who named the now infamous metropolis of Atlantic City. In April 1857, Edward wrote that he intended to apply for the superintendents or resident engineership of the Lebanon Valley Railway when it opened to the public. And a week later, he wrote his application to the president and directors of the company, but was not successful. By the end of the year, he was writing to his brother-in-law that he received an unexpected offer to go to Mexico on a railroad survey. The expedition left New Orleans on the 1st of January 1858 and arrived at Vera Cruz four days later. He was part of the 1st Brigade, which was led by Edward's friend M. E. Lyons, with whom he had once worked on the Shannon Navigation. Richards undertook a reconnaissance of the possible Jalapa route to Mexico City, but found it to be unfavorable. He was in charge of a party that was sent to examine the passes north of Perote, but by March, he was back in Pennsylvania. Surprisingly, in a letter four weeks later, he makes it clear that his connection with the Lebanon Railway had ceased. The importance of considering a manuscript or letterbook such as this in the context of other material in an archive is highlighted by the fact that there is no mention in the archive that he had left Mexico for home because of the illness and consequent death of his 60-year-old son, John, who died of scarlet fever. On his journey home from Mexico in February 1858, he wrote to his wife, Sarah, you have been the best mother and wife a man ever had. Edward, Sarah, and their daughter, Taylor, continued to live in Lebanon for some months before returning to their original home at Moore's Ordinary, now known as Meheron, in the state of Virginia. Likewise, his letters to his mother expand on his explanation for resigning from the Lebanon Railway. A sudden economic depression, known as the Panic, affected the United States in 1857 and seriously impacted railroad construction. Edward first mentioned the Panic in the middle of November 1857, and in a letter of the 13th of December, he wrote that the Lebanon Valley Company were very regular pay paymasters until this confounded panic took place, indicating that it was not paying its dues, nor probably Edward's salary. Railway engineering may have been a close-knit profession, but that did not mean that everybody worked in harmony. Edward made it clear that he disliked Osborne, the latter exacerbating the dislike by reducing Edward's salary and at the same time increasing his own. Writing to his mother back in Ireland, Edward says, the place on the Lebanon Valley Railroad that I was looking for was not in Osborne's gift. If it was, I would have never have sought it. He would not give me a straw's value. Neither would I take it from him. He also writes of a long running quarrel between Osborne and Lyons, despite the fact that Lyons had also worked uh, under him on the Waterford and Limerick line. A few years later, however, the pair were working together again on the Camden Atlantic line, but the relationship soon soured. Despite his dislike for the man, Richard makes dispassionate reference to a railway accident in which Osborne and his brother were both nearly killed. Osborne gave his own account of the ac accident in his diary. William Donnelly, he wrote, one of my faithful Waterford and Limerick men had both thighs broken, and he died ere he got to Camden. The Matanoi locomotive never drew another breath, and our fireman was instantly killed. Some of the in invited guests had been injured, and two others fatally. Other accounts make it clear that Osborne had organised a special excursion on the line in order to distract from financial concerns but the train collided with the Mahanoy engine, which should have been parked on a siding. Osborne's diary demonstrates that a number of contractors and workmen were traveling backwards and forwards between Ireland and America, depending on the work available. One of these was a Patrick O'Reilly, and Osborne wrote 
that he had asked him to come back to Ireland to work on the Waterford Limerick line. Once O'Reilly had finished his portion of the contract, he returned to the United States. O'Reilly's name features frequently in Edward's 1857-58 letterbook, recording that O'Reilly and Osborne had a spectacular falling out in later years over their respective landholdings in the new Atlantic City. Among the contents of the letterbooks, some of the non-official letters are revealing of Edward's character and attitudes. There are two letters about an unsatisfactory servant girl. I should state, he said, that she has from first to last shown a very bad temper towards the children. She is without exception one person I ever saw. She is too proud and seems to imagine that she is too good to associate with anyone around here and far too high to help out in our family. Edward's letters to his mother make frequent reference to difficulties with those he calls servants, but his letter of September 1857 is very explicit. Commending the arrival of a public gas service in town, he adds anything to save labour, especially the labour of those pests, the female servants. They are curses. There is, comparatively little, there is comparatively little trouble with men here, but those odious women, the Irish especially, I abominate them. Incidentally, a current researcher of the archive is finding that Edward has signs of a love-hate relationship with women, which complicates the lives of, the female, of female friends and relations and casts a shadow over him. He's not complimentary either about migrant Irish labourers in America, saying that despite the closure of the railway and in, an in, impending bad winter for work, those fools of Irish are squandering away their money as usual, just as if there was a plentiful season ahead of them. Now, while Edward was intolerant of servants and Irish labourers, he absolutely abhorred slavery and its prevalence in Virginia was one of the reasons for his moving to Kansas where abolitionists were strong. Several letters express his concern that two Negro women, as he writes, should be properly paid for work on his father-in-law's estate in Virginia. The letters were written as executor to his father-in-law and are particularly concerned with the provision that the plantation of Moore's Ordinary was to be worked in common for the benefit of his widow and her two daughters. As Edward explained in a letter to his lawyer, it does not answer to work the plantation in common, as we have done for the last two years. Apparently unwilling to resolve Edward's concern for fairness, the family had agreed to rent it out and divide the process to, among the three residuary leg leg legatees. Edward did not use the term Negro in a derogatory way. It was simply the common description at the time, but rather he gives them dignity by using their names, Kitty and Mounting. This is an example of his commitment to fairness and a determination to remove exploitation. Nearly two decades separate this letterbook from the next in the series, but Edward's attitudes and characters are, are already manifest. By 1876, when he started the second letterbook, he was back at Monk Grange, a landlord. His interest in, in engineering is still obvious, and he had just embarked on his astronomy phase. His ideas are even more definitely fixed, sometimes to the point of his intransigence. But his softer side is seen in the regular correspondence that she maintained with his surviving daughter, Adela, by this time a young adult. By now, through the letterbooks, we have learned something of Edward's personality and character and something of the working experience of a professionally quali qualified emigrant. Here he is in 1902, then living in Ross Lair, having gifted Monk Strange to his daughter, Adela Orpen. From his letters, we have learned something about the people at the executive level of railway building, at the same time being mindful that folk songs and ballads were singing of the working man. We've learned about the vitality of the international labour market with engineers relocating to and fro across the Atlantic as opportunities arose. 
we've learnt that Edward cared about a fair day's pay for a fair day's work for everyone. We've learned that he believed in racial equality, but was disdainful of the Irish labourer. By reading all six volumes, a pretty clear picture of Richards the man and the times he lived in could be painted using these first-hand accounts as primary source material. On completion of the 2021 digitization and indexing project, Monk's Grange Archives will publish an index of all six letterbooks and page images will be available on request. This project would not have been financially possible without the generous su uh, grant support of the Heritage Council, which enables increased access to a valuable research resource for public and community benefit. I would like to acknowledge the use of comments made by Katrina Crowe and Jeremy Ferreter. I am indebted to archivist Le Leslie Whiteside for her invaluable work on these letter books and her understanding of the holistic nature of the books and their content will enable the conservation, preservation and interpretation of these volumes written by a Wexford native who enjoyed an international career in railroad construction and brought up a young family in the mid 19th century economic boom of East Coast America. He had fled in grief to the plains of Kansas in 1860, following the death of his wife and newborn daughter Dora, his firstborn son having died two years before. He had fought in the American Civil War at the Battle of Mine Creek, and in 1866 returned to Wexford to take on the family farm at Monk's Grange where he worked through the period of land agitation that finally resulted in the freehold acquisition by tenants of lands previously held as rentals. Edward Richard's letterbooks are a priceless mine of original material. They will help underline the strength of archival content and they will enrich the history of the communities whence they came. Finally, offering my thanks to Jarlath Glynn and Dennis Gorthy Library for facilitating this talk, I also thank you for listening, and I remain obediently yours. Thank you, Jeremy, for a most interesting and informative lecture. If you'd like to learn more about Monk's Grange, there's a history of the house by Philip Bull, published by Four Courts Press. Alternatively, you can go to monksgrange.com. This is the first in a series of lectures this autumn from Inniscorthy Library. And if you would like to check out what is coming up, you can go to the Inniscorthy Library Facebook page. Thank you and good evening.